This Twin Peaks Investing Podcast is brought to you in association with SharePad from ShareScope, the UK's number one investment data and analysis software for private investors and traders. Visit sharescope.co.uk and discover the advantage. Hello and welcome to the Twin Peaks Investing Podcast. This is podcast number 122. My name is Peter Higgins. You can find me at Congress 3. And today I'm here with my brilliant two co-hosts, Phil Oakley and Henry Viola Hare. It's been a very, very busy week. Um, Myself and Henry were treated by our sponsors last week. And um, we're going to share with you a little something that we did last weekend. We actually went to see Cirque Soleil in London, very posh end of town. Henry and I nearly got chased out because we're like, what are these two vagabonds doing this side of the town? But we went there and wanted to say a big, big thank you to the sponsors of this podcast, ShareScope, SharePad, that invited us um, along to that particular show. And we were were with um, Investment Royalty in um, Rosie Carr of IC, Investors Chronicle, Algie Hall as well. What were the other names there as well, Henry? Jamie Ward? Oh, we had Ramin of um, Pension Craft. Very good YouTube channel if anybody's not listened to it. You know, so yeah, we were were very, very blessed. And of course, Phil was meant to be there, but had better things to do. You know, he's he's too too good to be sharing the night with us little plebs, but there we go. Right. Guys, I'm I'm conscious of the time. We overran last time, so we're not going to do any other chit chat we're just going to jump straight in to this unless one of you two guys have got something significant to say about anything phil anything uh no no henry all good mate no all right okay so today big day in the markets okay um jeremy whose surname lots of people pronounce differently um came out with the budget and started talking about British ISA and a few other bits and pieces and an additional £5,000 which can be utilised to be spent on UK, I'm not sure if it's listed or UK stocks, whatever it is, an extra £5,000 for those of us that have got that extra 5000 to invest. Um, my my thoughts straight away was some people are going to reduce <laughs> their exposure in the main ISA <laughs> and then spend it elsewhere and then use that extra five to put into a UK listed company. I don't know. I just wanted to get your first thoughts on that British ISA stuff because there were big, so much talk and leaks about it all um, straight away. Um, go to you first, Phil. Did you have any thoughts on that today? Uh, yeah, I mean, any any sort of increase in the tax-free savings allowance is, is good. But it's, uh, I mean, as you point out, Pete, you know, if you've got, 20,000 to put away, you're doing quite well in life. Um, yeah. And another 5,000, you know, so so much the better. Um, I'm not sure it really it really changes much. Um, my, my view is just because you've got 5,000 to put into British shares, only do it if you can find the right shares to uh, to invest in. You know, there's no point putting five thousand pounds in British shares just because they're British, and you end up with either losing money or uh, making making sort of sub subpar returns from it. Um, but if you can do it and you have that amount of money, then uh, it's it's not a bad thing. But I don't think it changes, you know, the the, the marketplace for for uh, for UK shares drastically. Fair, 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 fair points there, mate. Thank you for sharing. Any any thoughts, Henry, or were you too busy at the dentist to, to take any notice of that today? <laughs> no, I did. I did catch the budget today. Um, I, I'd agree with Phil. You know, I think if you've got an investment allocation and an investment approach, suddenly narrowing yourself to just investing in the UK for a portion of your ISA, probably not the smartest move you could make. Uh, like you say, Peter, if you want to transfer part of your allowance from your main ISA into this British ISA, and keep your British allocation in the British ISA and then in- invest internationally elsewhere. 
personally, I would suggest that that is, is probably a, um, a more diversified way of going about it. The, thought, the main thought that I had, and I think I made this point on an earlier podcast, is that I think the government is really going about this the wrong way. There is a reason that the UK market is underperforming. There is a reason we are unloved. Um, and what they ought to be doing is addressing those issues, whether it is tax, whether it is infrastructure, whether it's skills base, um, whether it's market liquidity, I don't know. But I don't think that trying to funnel a number of retail investors into UK shares is really going to move the needle as much as they're hoping. Personally, I'd like to have seen something more along the lines of capital allowances um, being expensed or tax breaks for staff or, or subsidies for um, you know apprenticeships or the like in the technology sector, uh, something that would have made a difference to UK businesses as opposed to financial engineering for shareholders. So very, I'm, very uh, I'm quite there. underwhelmed by by that news. Yeah, very, very good points there, May. Very, very acutely there and really appreciate that. I, 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 I took a bit of note today. I was watching this and um, basically 12.29 before Jeremy Hunt came out with the budget speech, starting at 12.30, I looked at the FTSE All Share and it stood at... 4,191.94. Then he began his talk and he said what he said about various different things and what he's going to do for the economy and so on and so on and so forth. And the FTSE All Share rose in the first, you know, half an hour or so and climbed, went to 4,198. And then as he carried on, it dipped. And then when he finished, the market just sat around for a little while and went, actually, some of this isn't too bad. And then it climbed again, FTSE All Share, and ended up with a high today of 4,211. Right, So it climbed to a high of 4,211 and then finished at 4,199. Um, and overall, it was up half a percent today. So the market wasn't quite sure what to what to do with all of this particular news regarding it. And I think we'll find out over the course of the next month or so. Um, and if it, and if it is a smart move, it will mean that more people will be encouraged to come into the market between now and the end of the tax year. And it might then give it another boost when the new um, ISA season and tax year commences at, at the beginning of April. Um, so we, we, we will see. But I think it's a small, I don't want to say gimmick, but. There's far more important things going on that needs to be done about the whole market infrastructure, I think, in agreement with you both. And also about whether stamp duty is too high, whether there's enough liquidity, whether or not it should be the pension funds and institutions that should be forced to actually invest more in the UK because they've, they've got more bang for their buck regarding our pensions and the institutional pensions, you know, force them to be putting 5% of their monies at the very, very minimum into the UK stock market. You know, because it's it's dwindling uh, as we speak as to how much they're putting into the UK stock market. FTSE today um, closed up 0.43%. So closed at 7,679. We had a high today, intraday high of 7,701. That 7,000 barrier is still sitting there and we, we can't seem to close above it at present. It'd be nice to see that happen um, within the next couple of days before the week's out, if not carrying on through March. I've already covered the FTSE All Share. Um, FTSE AIM All Share um, closed up 0.37% at 737. So that's still sitting above that 700 um, support level. So that's all good um, regarding the markets today. Um, conscious that I need to talk about one stop before we start, Phil, and go to a stop from you. Um, mentioned back in December at T Twin Peaks 117, good old Greg's. Um, which brought a cheer to um, our young man's eye there, you know, Henry Viola, the man who loves Greg's. And I know you don't mind a, a Greg's occasionally as well, Phil. Uh, mentioned um, Greg's um, as a recommendation to go away and research. Nearer to 26 quid in December. Came up with a reasonably good update in January. And then, and then uh, yesterday came out and absolutely smashed numbers and basically cheered everybody up um, regarding their um, performance 
And then what did they do on top of that? Decided to pay a special dividend. And um, the dividend will also be going to, I think, about 80% of the employees as well. Um, so they're going to be paying out a dividend of 40 pence plus the normal, sorry, special dividend 40 pence plus 62 pence. So that's one pound and two pence per share it's delivering. And the shares are currently 28 pounds 50, up 9.5% year to date. And everyone's having a sausage roll by the looks of it. Any of you guys been watching the news on Greg's? Uh, yeah, uh, it's, it's a great business. <clears throat> um, you know, it's, 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 it's doing so well because it just knows what to do to keep its customers happy. And, it, and it's been doing this for a long time. It's selling a product at a very fair price. Um, I think that, you know, cash strapped commuters, um, workers, lunchtime workers, it plays into that theme quite nicely. Um, you're going to get people who turn their nose up it you know, saying that they're selling a lot of junk food. But to me, there's no difference really from what they're selling to what, you know, McDonald's are selling. And, and I'd and argue it's better, better Phil. <laughs> yeah, you know, or Pret-a-Manger. I mean, okay, you can, there's a few salads and stuff in there, but it's... Uh, Terrible stuff. Avoid it like the plague. It's a great, it's a great business. Um, you know, you look at the size of the stores that they've got, and you look at the volume of stuff that they're selling, and you know they're making great, great profits, great returns on those stores. Um, they're going where the people are, so they're going into like railway stations, airport, roadside. Um, it's a business that's still got plenty of legs, and it's um, yeah, it's a, it's a great success story, and long may it continue. Absolutely. I mean, I'm looking at the numbers and it's like for like sales, 13.7% um, year, year on year. PBT, profit before tax, plus 26.97. Um, I'm just thinking, wowza. And they just seem to be just doing, like you say, absolutely everything right. Uh, so a, a UK um, success story. Um, you know, you know, not I'm, I know that most people aren't friends of the, the Sun newspaper, but it was that centre stage there. Greg's a twenty six, a two point six billion success story, um, eighty years in the baking, which I thought was a quite clever headline. Um, but yeah, and they got some of their stores from what was it Associated British Foods for an absolute song many years ago, um, which I thought was clever. I bet um, Associated British Foods are now thinking to themselves. Oof. I mean, a bit of a mistake there. I think the thing is as well, Pete. Um, the other, the other, the other big story is that um, Greg's now is the market leader um, in breakfast sales. It's got nearly twenty percent share of the market, and it's actually overtaken McDonald's. Has it really? Yeah, yeah. It's um, it's got nearly twenty percent. Wow. See, and I, I knew I missed a trick when I didn't buy it. When I was when I was wailing and ban wailing like a banshee to you, Henry, uh, back in December before Phil came on, and I was saying I wish I'd bought them at ten quid, and now it's going to be nudging thirty quid before the year's out. I'm like, oh, what an idiot, man! What an idiot. And the thing is, yeah. Pete, taking over is, McDonald's. Uh, I think the thing is, is that um, Greg's haven't actually been concentrating on breakfast for that long. No. It's always lunch just do it well. Well, I think the um, the other thing, every Greg's store I've been in, bar one, which I'm going to call a fluke, um, I've never had to wait. I've walked straight in. They've had exactly what I want. I've been in and out the shop almost instantly and really satisfied with the, with the produce I've bought. I mean, usually it's a bag of sausage rolls, but, you know. Whereas a lot of other shops, you know, you walk into a prep, and it's like, geez, they've got four people on the till, so they're 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 not understaffed, but the queues are enormous. And if you go in, I mean, certainly in the city, if you go in much past about quarter to one in the afternoon, the shelves are empty. I've never had that at Greg's. I've always been able to get freshly cooked sausage rolls instantly at a great price. You know, I think they're doing something right because with prep, after a while, you go, well, you know, forget it. Every time I go in here, 
either I'm losing half my lunch break queuing around for a soggy sandwich or they've not got anything when I go. So what's the point? Mm. Well, Henry, this is not about you um, turning up to Greg's, having me chauffeured there in a limo and they look and go, it's Henry and they just, everyone else has to move out of the queue. <laughs> Are you sure? I'm not quite that famous yet. <laughs> right. Okay. Okay. So I just thought thought I'd check. Thought I'd check. <laughs> right. Okay. We've done the we've done the done the Greg's and the sausage rolls. Bill, let's get on to your first doc or whatever topic you want to talk about first, please, mate. I think just before I do, I thought it might just be useful to spend a couple of minutes talking about you know the the, the big story or the, the consistent story that keeps coming across is the the number of takeovers um, <clears throat> and the cheapness of the of the UK stock market, and you know we're just seeing seeing more and more of them now. And um, I think this is this is something that is going to keep going on. I think you're absolutely right, Phil. I mean, the the volume of offers we are getting for really quality names in the UK is quite astonishing. You know, Curry's got snapped up not that long ago. I think it might even have been earlier this week. Uh, now, the last time I went into a Curry shop, to be honest, I was appalled. They'd got no stock. The staff couldn't help me. And I remember them as being really quite a good brand. I'd never have figured them for a takeover target. And yet somebody's come in, offered a premium and, and snapped them up. And it seems That's to be the same snapped, story yeah, across the market. Yeah. <laughs> Henry hasn't quite been snapped up yet because they've rejected oh, they've the offer. Gone through. It's not they've gone through. They've rejected yet, mate. the it's offer. There. The, 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 basically, the CEO, sorry, not the CEO, one of the fund managers is kicking off saying, you know, if we're not careful, we're going to lose more and more companies. Um, and this is the reason why even Curry's may, be, may have to consider, um, you know, listing abroad. And I'm like, um, because they're basically with, with saying respect. that if this, was, um, if this was a US company, They'd be getting twenty five percent more. So they they're basically saying they want two pounds. With, with share. all respect to our one, esteemed one, one seventy five, I think they've been offered or something like that. Um, so that's still that's still going on, mate. It hasn't actually gone yet, um, but they're not happy with the price. They're wanting more, and now they're coming out saying, you know what? If we're not careful, we're going to lose another company to to the US. You know, Hambro Hambro veteran fund manager James Lowen and Clyde Beagle said it said that said an, an acceptable offer for the retail should be one pound per share sorry um versus what they're being offered now so uh yeah not happy so mm. we'll see but curries is still in the mix we'll see what happens with that but lots I, of lowly shares what did you I, want to add phil i think it's interesting that even even at the current share price of, of curries um which is a sort of around sort of 67 pence mark uh, it's only on eight times earnings, and you know some people might say, "Well, that's that's all it's worth." Um, but you know, clearly, clearly, there's a fight on here, and I and I, I understand the uh, the concerns of of fund managers who, who get frustrated if if they feel that they're getting you know taken for a ride and that, that companies are being taken out. Uh, so cheaply but um you know there's a there's a no end of you know of of, uh, of candidates i think particularly i think in the mid and small cap um market where you know you're looking at market capitalizations of i don't know three billion or less or even into the hundreds of of millions and that's not a big a big price tag for for you know, big corporates from from the US or you know in China in the case of Curry's all all private private equity, and you know you could see see businesses that have got you know falling on very hard times. I, I know you talked about watches of Switzerland a few weeks ago. You know that that share is like over fifty percent off its high. It's now on nine times earnings, and those that's reduced earnings. Um, you know, people talk about ITV all the time. Um, ITV Studios, I think, would be quite an interesting buy for somebody. 
And even like, you know, companies like Marks and Spencer's, you know, on sub 10 times earnings, Jet2, which I've talked about a lot on eight times earnings. These are the kind of uh, kind of shares that you think, you know, could get taken out. I mean, WH Smith was mentioned in a newspaper article this morning. That's on 13 times earnings. You're not buying that for the high street shops in the UK. You're buying it for the for the retail concessions in airports, um, and that's a that's a global business, and that's on thirteen times earnings, and it's you know looking like it's going to grow its earnings ten twelve percent for the next three years. So there is there is a lot of a lot of value out there, and. I think the other thing is the other thing that I've seen this week is that there was something on uh, on Market Watch, which is a, for those of you who don't know is like a, an online news feed for investors, and, and and it was saying that UK investors are ploughing ever increasing amounts of money into foreign shares, and this this sort of brings into what we started talking about at the beginning of the podcast, in that you know. Do you do you buy these shares and wait for wait for a takeover and it doesn't happen? And at the same time, you could have been invested in a US stock that's going gangbusters. I mean, that's the dilemma that's facing people. You can have these shares which look cheap, but if you're buying them for a takeover that doesn't happen, you're not going to make any money from them. Um, but it's, I think it's going to it's going to be very interesting. This is a quick hello to you, our valued Twin Peaks Investing Podcast listener. Whatever channel you're listening to, please make sure to subscribe and you'll always be the first to get the new episodes. Thank you for your continued support. Absolutely. I mean, the, the one that happened, um, I think it was, was it yes, I've lost this track of the days, guys, uh, was, was Spirant. Um, an, an old friend turned enemy of mine um, because I bought the shares um uh, oh, good a good while back now it seems and i i you know rather than i think it was oh, yeah let me just get the dates right 10th of the 10th of march 2022 i bought spirant having done my intrinsic value and so so some of the parts sort of valuation on it and i had it at four pound all day long right so i picked up the shares at two pound 43 phil right it's going to be involved in 5G. It's going to be involved in all the testing for, 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 for all of the all to do with AI and tech and all the rest of it. It's going to be a go-to stock, right? I even had it as my um, my proactive stock, a, a stock challenge that I do against fund managers. So I put my head up above the parapet and went, my stock spirants, right, for 2023. <laughs> January, I think it was the second or third trading day of the year. I own the stock. I've tipped it as my, well, I shouldn't read the words. Yeah, I actually did tip it because it was that's what the competition was. And I tipped it going into the new year as my stock of the year. I think it was two or three trading days in, Wallop smashed it with a profit warning. And I was like, wowza. And I'm in the competition. I'm thinking, I can't just go back and, and say after the, the first week of the year, I've actually sold the stock myself, so I'm not sure I want to keep it in the competition. So I held the stock. No excuses. It, it, regardless, I should have just gone, mm, maybe this is not going to be the year. But the intrinsic value was there at four quid. Got smashed. All right, it's now at two quid or less. And I'm going, hmm, someone's going to have to go and buy that now. Maybe now for £3.50. Cut a long story short, because I don't want to bore people with this, right? Four profit warnings happened during 2023 on Spirant. After the fourth one, you know, I'm, I've got the patience of a saint I have when it comes to dogs of stocks, right? And some people say, Pete, and they'll say to Phil, and they'll say to Henry, one profit warning, get out. Why? Because profit warnings ordinarily come in threes. Not for me, mate. I'll go four rounds and get knocked down in each four in each round. Finally, I capitulate at 95 pence, Phil, right? In November of last year, November of 2023, I've gone, I'm out. I'm done. I can't take no more pain. Took the hit, significant hit, by the way. I got out at nine, just more than 95 pence, right? 
And the consolation for me is that my exit, right, signal the bottoming of the shares, right? Now, who doesn't want to signal the bottom of the shares when they rise 100% over the next four months, even though they might have gone out without you, right? So now you've got an American company going, we'll have a bit of that. And the, it's a one billion pound offer, but the shares are going to be taken out for dividends plus one pound seventy five. These shares are worth three pounds, mate. So another bargain has been swooped upon by an overseas predator, and it's going to be taken out. And you know what? The board have gone. We've had enough as well, and they've already re recommended the offer at one seventy five. So another one of our tech st stocks have gone for one billion. You go back far enough. And you look at what they've bought over the X amount of years, last 10 years maybe, they spent more than that on, on mergers and acquisitions, Phil, that the whole group is now going for. Absolutely staggering mismanagement of, of the company. And another tech stock with relationships with all manner of different sensitive information is going to an overseas predator. But it's all, it's all right because this predator is American. So therefore, all our personal information is fine and our security is fine. Is it not? Guys, any I answers mean, to that? I think I think the sort Bill, of... you look bemused. I am a bit. I mean, I'm not sure. If this company hadn't been taken over, I'm not, you know, I'm not sure you'd want to buy it. You know, you know, after four profit warnings, it's a brave, it's a brave person to go and buy this. But... I think the, the golden rule here, and this is this is something that I think we can often forget as, as investors, is that often the value of a company to an acquirer is a lot more than it is as a standalone business on the stock exchange because a buyer can do things with it and create more value from it, like you know, cutting out costs or cross-selling, running it better. Um and this is all always always a sort of thing thing to bear in mind. But you know, hindsight is a wonderful thing and all that. But it's this is what I think you know you should do if you if you're looking at looking at shares in the UK market. You're thinking, okay, who you know who could buy this? Trying to identify who could buy it, uh, and then trying to work out you know what what they could pay for it and still make it stack up. Um, rather than, oh, it's cheap, it's depressed, I'll buy it and hope it gets taken over. It has to be a, has to be a bit more thought to it than that. There has to be, it has to be a strategic fit for somebody else, or it's so cheap that a financial buyer can go in and <clears throat> make a great deal. I mean, it seems to me the, the easiest trade at the moment is to buy, is to buy a British share Buy a British company and then go relist it on the uh, on the US stock market and and clear off. Job done. Phil, Phil, stop. Do not give our CEOs and CFOs any other ideas, mate, to deplete the UK stock market, mate. Please don't suggest that. I just have. Let me just finish on this Spirant thing, right? So the company that's taken it over, right, is Nasdaq listed. VRV, if I pronounce that right, V-I-A-V-I, -I, formerly JDS Uniphase. So they're big in the investing space. I have got my eyes on that company now, right? And at some point, I'm going to be watching that company. And betwixt now and whenever, I'm going to buy some shares in that NASDAQ-listed company, right? Because they're going to shred that company and shred Spirant and utilize the best parts and sell off the bits that they don't want. And they're going to benefit by the tune of at least a billion on that particular stock. And I'm going to be there going, thank you very much at some point. Unless they turn out to be just as incompetent as Spirit management and also have a car you, crash you, and full you profit. To, you had to go, you just had to go there, didn't you, anyway? Open goal. Not all, <laughs> not all management company are duds, mate. Only the ones that I pick. Only the ones that I pick. <laughs> After I've done all my research, they then scupper it. All right, Phil, any more on the takeovers, mate, you want to share? Oh, no, I think I think that's that's no, it. Well, you, you smashed it there. We, we are vulnerable. I've I'm going to be doing just ladies and gents. I'm going to be doing a panel session on Saturday at the Master Investor Show, 
um, with um, Gervais Williams, Stephen Yu, Charlie Huggins, and George O'Connor. And we are going to be asking them the question, why is the UK stock market so undervalued? And which stocks should we, we be considering for long-term potential? So that's absolutely timely. Um, so if you can, we'd love to see you at the Master Investor Show on Saturday. I'll be doing that with the Investing Matters team in the Southeast. But please, please, please do come along. It's going to be a fab day, three and a half to 5,000 people there. Lots of stores, lots of other companies. And Jim Mellon will be doing his, his Sage of Omaha uh, routine, which everyone loves to hear. Right, Henry. Give us your first stop. We'll go back to Phil in a minute because he's covered all takeover stuff. Give him a breather. Give us your first stop, please, sir. Uh, well, I've got two UK ones um, this week. Uh, my first one is an engineering business, which I hope listeners will know. And it's one of those names that, um, to me, represents great British engineering in the best possible sense. Uh, it is Renishaw PLC. The ticket is RSW. Uh, and this is a global engineering technology company that specializes in precision technology for metrology and healthcare. Uh, and for those of you that aren't aware of what metrology is, it's the scientific study of measurement. Uh, now, the company designs and develops systems for ensuring precision, control and reliability in engineering, in addition to being a leader in additive manufacturing, which for those of us that aren't engineers is 3D printing. Um, and it's 3D printing from metal powder, which is quite an interesting technology, because certainly when I think of 3D printing, I think of a little home printer that uses plastic polymers. Um, but actually, you can apply the same process to metal powder um, and you basically print liquid metal and create metal structures instead of plastic polymer ones. Um, now, the business is uh, quite a large one. It's on a market cap of uh, £3 billion. Um, it's always been a quality business, as long as I've known it. It's got a return on capital of about 16%, which is very healthy. Um, and it's forecast to grow its earnings per share over the next three years by about 7% a year. So it is forecasting growth. And I think that's possibly a reflection of its, its global customer base, to be honest. Um, unlike domestic UK businesses, which are perhaps struggling a little bit, uh, if you are diversified around the world, you've got lots of markets to sell to uh, and therefore lots of different customer bases to sell to. The share pays a small dividend. It's about 2% a year, um, which is covered, I believe. Uh, and it's on a fairly cheap price. I think it's closer to its 52 week lows than its 52 week highs. Um, so it's caught my eye as one of those great British giants that I think is perhaps being overlooked by the market in the desperation to buy all things American. So it could be one for listeners to go and have a look at. Interesting name, Henry. It's been up, up there and been mentioned as a quality stock for some time. But if they want to get, you know, a bit of a sprint on to get into Vogue, they need to mention something to do with AI. AI. <laughs> Have they done that yet in their RNS? Have they mentioned that that fabled word that gets them accelerated and re-rating? Have they done that yet? Or they're uh, a sleepy British engineer, too too posh to say artificial intelligence. I I think they're too busy doing real work with real you know real technology as opposed to pie in the sky robots that are going to take over the planet. <laughs> so your answer is no they have not mentioned ai yet. exactly <laughs> right not the top have, have you looked at have you looked at running shore before phil yeah 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 it's what, uh, what, are, your, what are your thoughts mate uh, give, give, give henry a boost or a doom doomster on it come on that's uh, a nice company um Ooh, go on. it's um it sort of fits you know we we, we do have um some very good engineering companies listed on the UK stock market and it's high end high end engineering manufacturing a lot of it is very niche uh problem solving um very very good in terms of like lowering the cost of the customer so it's a massive sort of enabler of higher profits for its customers um this is a really well well run business uh, run by uh, basically the two guys 
who run it, which is uh, David McMurty and Daniel Deere. They still own about 55% of the shares. And they have tried to sell the business and no one's come along and bought it because I think two things, I think, is the price. The price tag has always been pretty punchy on this, this company. And also, I think that they are very proud of what, of what they've developed with this company in terms of its culture. Um, the company is it's not short-termist. It has fantastic relationships with its customers. And it invests huge amounts of money you know, in research and development as a proportion of sales to develop new products. And unlike a lot of companies, it's... It doesn't mess around with the accounting. It's very, very clean accounting on this. So this is a this is this is a company with a lot to admire. The issue with it is that it's it's very sensitive to you know changes in the global economy and its profits are very very volatile. They move up and down a lot. So whilst the general trend in in revenues and profits over the long haul is probably upwards given the the markets that it's exposed to it's a rocky ride you know you'll get big ups and downs with it um but it's a business i like a lot i admire a lot and um yeah i i, I hope it i hope it does well and i hope eventually it will find new new shareholders that carry on the uh the great culture that the company has there you go. Brilliant. Love that insight, Phil. Thank you very, very much for that. Um, I'm going to go abroad now with mine. Mine's very a, a random walk, and I see this um, sometimes. I, I I was looking at um, on on SharePad, and I've put in the search for stocks hitting 52-week highs, and I'm always looking out for anomalies. And I saw this, and I thought, what, what's going on there? What what have I what have I missed regarding this particular stock? And three stocks were sitting on Monday at all time all time highs. Forget about fifty two week highs, all time highs. One of them was Bank of Georgia. The other one was Georgia Capital. And the third one I'm going to talk about is TBC Bank Group, UK based banking group. Okay, um, London listed TBC out of Tbilisi, Georgia. And essentially, as a bank, it's the same sort of activities. Uh, business activities involves universal banking operations within Georgia and Uzbekistan. And the bank is focused on financial services activities, and most of its total assets relate to banking, insurance, leasing, brokerage, corporate advisory services. And it operates, its operating segments include corporate, micro, basically SMEs, um, enterprises, retail, corporate centers, and oper other operations. Most of its revenues are derived from retail from the retail segment, which includes non-business individuals or individual business customers. But I want to point this bit out, and I'm not going to go too, into too much about this bit here because it can be quite sensitive, and I don't want to get us pulled off air by um, forces um, unbeknown to us. But... On the 22nd of February 2022, something significant happened, which was Russia began the invasion of the Ukraine. Okay. The 28th of February 2022, ticker symbol TBCG shares hit the low of £9.60. That's the 28th, six days later. The shares are currently sitting at £32.50. That's how much the shares have gone up in the space of two years, two years, literally two, two weeks ago. The shares have gone from £9.60 to £32.50. Now, sanctions against Russia, did it, did it, did blah, 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 blah. Someone's pouring money into Georgia for a reason for those three companies to be at all time highs. Um, what's the company doing? Basically, um, we're looking at Profits going up year to date. Um, the thing that interests me about this bit as well is growing digital customers, right? On the last accounts, up 33% in 
in 12 months, right? And registers customers up 40% year to date. Where are all these customers coming from? Could this continue? I do not know. Um, but right now it's on a PE of 5.28, yielding 5.39. The shares have already gone up three and a half fold, right? No one is talking about TBC Bank. Maybe because of what's going on, people going, we don't want to go with that. It's, you know, Russia's not far away. Da, da, da. But it's one of those stocks that nobody wants to buy because, but someone's buying the stock for it to go from £9.60 to 33 quid. Henry, any thoughts yeah, on TB? I, I'm not I, recommend, I, I'm saying there's something I found. I'm not saying go out and buy it now after it's gone up from £9.60 to 33 quid nearly. I'm just saying this thing's at all time high. No yeah. one's no one's chasing this particular stock. No one's I, I, tipped it anywhere in a magazine. It just keeps gliding up there on its Jack Jones. I Henry, am super thoughts? wary of this. Um, I've seen the Bank of Georgia for a long time, and on paper it looks like a super high quality business. Ticks a lot of metrics. Um, TBC Bank I have also seen ticks a lot of metrics that I like. Good returns um it's cheap nice dividend yield that is covered the risk for me is the political risk you know if you were going to invade the country next door and knew you were going to do it what do you think the share price is going to do when you do you're going to tank the share prices and then what are you going to do buy through shell companies so to me this is i might be a little tinfoil hat that but for me the political risk and the geographic risk just make this an absolute no go for me. I I wouldn't dare Absolute. touch it. Absolutely, but fair fair point. The, the, the other thing to mention as well is that Georgia is still in the process of looking for ascension to the to the um to NATO. Sorry, the EU. Sorry, to the EU. So there's all that stuff going on, which obviously is going to irk certain people in Russia as well. Phil, have you looked at anything in Georgia? I have. Um... That's not I, a euphemism, mate. You didn't need to smile no, so no, hard no. there. No, it's um, actually last week I I um, I wrote a piece for my my CityWire, um, my CityWire job, which is the elite companies. So if, if you go to yep. the CityWire CityWire website, elite companies, we wrote I uh, wrote a piece on the top ten shares that are being backed by the elite for managers, and one of those one of those shares is uh, is Georgia Capital. And this yep. is this again is has been a uh, the incident. It's like an investment. It's an investment trust, basically investing in investing in Georgia. Trades at a big discount to net asset value for the reasons that Henry has has touched on, but actually going great guns. And um, the the Georgian economy is incredibly strong. Uh, GDP growth in Georgia last year was over seven percent. Um, you know, much faster than what's going on in most industrialized nations at, at the moment. And thing to remember about banks as banks are li literally geared plays on a on a nation's economy. And it's quite interesting. I've you know over the last sort of year since I've been I've been doing a lot of work for elite companies, for CityWire, looking at global shares, emerging markets like India, and looking at the banks and the profitability of the banks in these markets. And they are earning staggering profits. Um, and I, I looked on SharePad before we came on for, for, for the TBC, and its last return on equity was 26%. Now, just to put that into into the kind of context, that's about double the likes of NatWest are making. Um, it's the kind that um, on board the risk, but if you if you are going to play uh, an emerging market. Um, you play into the growth of the emerging market and you go in with your eyes open and you accept the risks, then one of the best ways to do it is probably to buy shares in a bank. Um, so if you were looking for a, if you if you've got the risk appetite and you, you know you, you 
you take on board that you could, could lose the money, then buying something like a bank in an emerging economy that's growing quickly, it's already done well, uh, could keep on doing well. But, you know, I take on board what Henry's said. Yeah, yeah, good, good call. I, I like the shout. I'm just going to run some numbers here. I like to do my total returns comparisons here. You mentioned that West. I'd done my um, comparisons um, versus Lloyd's because lots of people have Lloyd's shares as well. And um, five year total returns compounded um, plus 18.3% um, for um, TBCG. Lloyd's uh, five year compounding at minus 1.97. Um, three years plus 47.9% versus Lloyd's plus 10.24%. Over the last one year, total returns for um, TPCG, sorry, TBCG, uh, plus 34.2% versus Lloyd's minus 0.284%. Crazy, crazy numbers. Anyway, there you go. Just the research idea, ladies and gents. It's already done extremely well. Do not chase it now but have a, keep an eye out you know and um we'll see what happens with that uh phil your first stock of the day please sir okay so I, this one is um this one is a it's a FTSE 100 stock um one that sort of easily overlooked one that's been going not doing too well but there are signs that this business is turning around and that company is Smith and Nephew. Uh, the ticker is SN dot. And um, for those of you that don't know, this is a company, sort of a medical equipment company. Um, very big in things like joint replacements. So artificial knees, hips, that kind of thing. Sports medicine, ear, nose and throat type surgical uh, products and wound care, which is obviously very important after surgery. Now, this is a company that's been a serial underperformer. Um, you'd think it was been a good place, exposed to aging populations um, and you know rising spending on healthcare, but it's not not been delivering up until recently. We have recently had some results, but pretty good. Um, it looks like the, the CEO that's gone in there is turning it around in terms of getting some revenue growth. There's still work to do on the, the joint replacement business, particularly in the US. Um, but they, they are um, sticking with their targets to get their profit margins up, which are already at quite a good level, sort of mid to high teens profit margin. And this looks like a you know a company that could start delivering pretty decent earnings growth over the next few years. And just to give you an example, you know it's got a market cap of about nine nine point four billion, so it's not a small company. Um, but if you were to say compare it, probably one of its biggest comparators is the U.S. company called Striker, and. This company is um, got a stock market value of $135 billion. It makes 25% margin, so it's more profitable than Smith & Nephew, but it's on nearly 30 times earnings, whereas Smith & Nephew is on half that multiple. And I, I, I sense that there's, it looks like there's some momentum beginning to build in Smith & Nephew. In a good market with good fundamentals, you've got costs coming out, you've got growth, and it's at a reasonable price. And I think that's something that could be worth a look. Whether you are an experienced or new investor, you know how valuable it is to conduct portfolio enhancing analysis and to have easy access to data that will give you the edge. As a Twin Peaks Investing Podcast listener, you can access an exceptional offer via SharePad from ShareScope, the UK's number one investment data and analysis software for private investors and traders. This special Twin Peaks offer is available to new subscribers only, and you can subscribe using the promo code TWINPEATS. The incredible and exclusive offer 
means that monthly subscribers will get their second month free and annual subscribers will get their 13th month free. Sign up and subscribe to SharePad today using the Twin Pete's promo code and you can save up to £69. Visit sharescope.co.uk forward slash sharepad for further details and subscribe to the investing and trading analysis and data you need. I picked this stock as my um, 2024 tip of the year with the proactive challenge against fund managers. Um, and it was doing reasonably well. I'd already bought it at the end of October of 2023 at sub £9.50. I've done my intrinsic um, work on this and my some of the parts um, because what's, that's what I do. I want that margin of safety. My personal belief is that this stock will get taken over. I don't want it to be taken over because another one of our good stocks will go. But my some of the parts valuations is nearer to £20 on this stock. Um, the results came out on the 27th and the shares went to £12. Then they got sold off during the rest of the day. Sorry, nearer to nearer to £12. And they got sold off and it's currently sitting at 10 plus pounds. Um, I, I see this stock when it gets the momentum and the CEO does what he needs to do at some stage during this year or next being re-rated. Re, re um, otherwise, they're going to do something to get that re-rating. Um, whether or not they'll consider dual listing in the US to get you know, towards strikers um, uh, earnings rate of 30, 30 times versus their 16 at the moment um is a possibility but right now because i've had such bad luck over the past few years where they've not really accelerated their their revenue streams they've been devalued and devalued and devalued but somebody will either come and take them out or put them out of the misery or they'll have to re-rate on their own um but yeah so i've already i already all this stock and i'm hoping it gets a re-rate on its own steam i do not want someone to come and offer a 50 percent premium and take it out at 15 quid because that'll be just daylight robbery all over again. Um, and, you know, they are going to be using more and more tech, robotics and AI to do the stuff they want to do. So there's less and less intrusive operations going forward. And some of the, the tools and solutions that they actually provide for people will be engineered by robots and AI. So, yeah, I think they're going to be a, a tech stock, uh, med tech stock, essentially, is what they are now. So I think the re-rating re is going to happen at some point, but I hope it's not via M&A. Henry, have you looked at um, Smith & Nephew? I really like them. Very high quality um, name, in my opinion. Uh, like Phil says, it's the forecasts that get me. When I was reading the annual report, there were a lot of things in it that I really liked. Um, they seem to have a very clear plan for how they're going to grow the business and improve their margins. And I like that little bit like you i am rather concerned about it being taken out by a foreign competitor because it's such a tiddler compared to the u.s healthcare giants uh, and i think it'd be a real shame because it, it's a great uk success story in my opinion um and a little bit like you know structural steel and coal uh and agriculture that we keep selling off and import and then having to import from elsewhere healthcare equipment is something that we need. We need a healthcare system. Uh, and if we keep selling bits of it off all over the place, we're going to be at the mercy of US giants charging us, you know, three million pounds for a fake knee or whatever. God help us. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I mean, you, you touched on the word there, and Phil's touched on it as well. Um, it's sitting here at sub 10 billion pounds. It was a 20 billion pound company a couple of years back. Um, and Stryker, I think at some stage when I looked at it first time, wasn't a dissimilar sort of valuation X amount of years ago um, to, to Smith & Nephew. And there was talk about them looking to buy Smith & Nephew back then. And since then, the valuation is, of Stryker has just left it, in, left it in its wake. It's lapped it a couple of times. So I don't know. Something needs to give. Um, let's see Let's see what happens. But yeah, great, great company, Phil. Quality company. Just needs to tidy itself up, mate, and start accelerating its growth path. And I think it will get a re-rating, but I'd like it to be on its own steam. Anything you want to add to that, Phil? No, 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 I think so. No, but thank you for that. There you go. You've nabbed one of mine now. You've done the battleship routine on me. So thank you for that. Not. So I didn't want to declare it just yet. Um, 
Okie dokie. Where are we at now? Henry, do you want to give us your um, your second stop, please, sir? Yeah, I've got another UK giant here. Um, another name which has been listed on the stock market for decades, which is a leader in its field uh, and which seems totally unloved by the market for reasons I can't quite fathom. Uh, the company is Victrex PLC. The ticker is VCT. This is a 1.1 billion pound market cap polymer manufacturer supplying a wide range of products in the aerospace um, aerospace sector. They produce surface coatings for electronic screens. They've got applications in medical devices uh, and their products are also used in over 100 million industrial machines. The company was the first in the world to commercialize something called peak plastic. That's P-E-E-K, which uh, for those of us that aren't chemists is polyether ether ketone, um, which to you and I is a colorless thermoplastic polymer. Now, the reason I quite like this company, again, a little bit like Renishaw, um, it's looking at a, a very depressed valuation. I used to own Victrex um, and the PE was significantly higher than it is now. It's currently on a PE of about 15. I think when I held it, it was over 20. Um, it pays a nice yield of four and a half, nearly five percent, healthy returns on equity in the double digits, mid teens, um, and a global market base. And to me, this is one of these companies that an awful lot of manufacturing businesses absolutely rely on. It's a, it's a leader in polymer manufacturing. Um, and yet we are treating it as though it's producing buggy whips to all intents and purposes. Nobody seems what? to want it. Nobody seems what? to care. Exactly. Buggy whips. <laughs> what, what's a buggy whip when it's at home, mate? Please explain. We're, Phil and I are northerners originally. What, what's what's right, a buggy whip? You, if you go back in time, about 150 years, when people used to ride round on horse and carts, the cart was called, right. called a buggy, and the driver of the buggy would have a whip for the horse, and that was called a buggy whip. Um, now, once okay. upon a time, there were hundreds of firms producing buggy whips, and I've no doubt that the last one left produced the best buggy whip in the world, but it still disappeared. Right. Okay. Phil, we're getting an education, mate. Uh, did you know that, Phil? You're a historian. Uh, no, I did not, no. <laughs> Carry, on, well, Henry. Carry on, mate. Forget being chauffeur-driven. Perhaps I'm dri driven round in a horse and buggy. Anyway, <laughs> I'll leave our listeners to ponder on that one. Um, but we, we just don't seem to value this business in the way that, personally, I feel we ought to. And I think, again, this is a really quality name that listeners could add to their portfolio that will do well over years, I think. It's it's not a business that's particularly cyclical. Um, it's very well run. And a little bit like Renishaw or Smith & Nephew, I could easily see a foreign competitor coming and snapping it up because it's used in such a wide variety of industrial applications. Uh, but it's a it produces a key a key manufacturing um commodity. So one to go and have a look at, ladies and gents. Okay. I've just I just pulled up some stuff here, Henry, and it, and it came out with some data early Feb and said revenues were down, volume was down, basically soft guidance uh, for the first quarter. Um, and then today, the um, one of the RNSs that's come out, if I get this correct, the CEO was just, it's, it's, well, it might be significant for him. It doesn't appear so for me, really, as a CEO. Um, Chief Executive Officer has gone out and purchased um, 50Ks worth of shares. So is he calling the bottom in the shares? Is is Or is that you saying you need to go out and buy the shares, Mr. CEO? But, you know, you've got some significant individuals that actually own the shares as well. Some, what you call, you know, quality investors like Norge Bank, that's got 8% of the shares. So it's not like anyone's shying away from buying them, but it just frustrates me that we've started the topic about shares being undervalued and possibly in, being threats of takeover. And this it's like every share that we're talking about could be at risk of being taken over. Absolutely. Yeah? And well, I, I, I your, think your thoughts. Are, sorry, go on, Henry. No, I was going to say, I think one of the big differences for the UK as opposed to foreign markets is domestic ownership. 
India has got a huge retail interest in investing. The Indian shares are terrifically expensive in some sectors. US shares are on massive multiples compared to UK comparators. The Australians, their superannuation funds, which are basically their version of our pensions, have got something like a 25% weighting to Australian shares. And yet here in the UK, we just don't love domestic businesses. The pensions own two to three percent, I think. You know, the, the government pension scheme owns two to three percent weighting towards UK shares. And UK investors seem far more excited by investing in the likes of Apple, for example, than they do owning something like Victrex. It's a recurring problem, mate. Yeah, we need to get the institutions buying. Um, most definitely. Um, I'm going to talk about another UK stock now, if I may, Phil, before you do your your, sec your second one. And they've got a base in, in Leicester and in City Centre, actually. Um, but essentially, they, they are um, a, a national and a global company. And this is essentially um, the industrial threads manufacturer, uh, Coates Group, and together with their subsidiaries, they manufacture and supply industrial threads worldwide. The company provides threads, yarn, zips, trims, composites, and fabrics for use in apparel, such as children's wear, denims, intimate underwear, ladies' wear, leather wear, you name it, where they're involved in it. And obviously, they're involved in bits and pieces that go into the car seating and all the rest of it. So they've got loads and loads of stuff going on. I'm put... I'm, putting a big risk on this now right because we're recording this and it's wednesday the 6th their full year results come out march the 7th which is tomorrow so by the time this is goes live on friday for those of you that are listening you'll be going what a muppet that conquers peter higgins is i've been mentioned coats it's been smashed the ribbons i'm i'm praying that they come out with reasonable results and the reason why i'm 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 going to say confident. Let's go with it. Let's just, you know, try and put some gloss on this. Um, is that they came out basically um, last year and said that they're doing reasonably reasonably well. And the shares had a bit of a pop. And I thought, you know what? It's 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 one of those sort of companies that gets gets ignored. No one talks about it. Who wants to talk about yarns and threads and all the rest of it? Um, it's it's had a, a bit of a challenging time of it and basically they, they were basically saying you know coats are now confident in achieving their 2024 goals of adjusted margins of around 17 percent um and i'm thinking you know what it's not too leveraged it's doing all right it's looking like it's going to 17 percent margin that's not too bad then they did something at the um beginning of december and basically the shares jumped 12 percent and they declared a halt to their pension deficit rep uh, and repairs program and opted to make a one-off lump sum payment of £10 million to move their pension, because they've, they've been running, this company's running forever, um, to run their, to move their pen UK pension scheme from deficit to surplus. And that decision is what spooked me to think, oh, let's see what happens with them. Um, is expected to result in a free cash flow benefit of two million pounds per month going forward. And I thought, hmm, let's just see what happens with this. So I'm not going to go into too much detail about it. They're involved in all manner of different things to do with fabrics and yarns. The results are out tomorrow, full year results are out tomorrow. Um let's let's just see what happens. Market cap is 1.1 billion. Um, PE, let me just get my, my notes up here, is sitting at 9.5, tiny little yield of 2%-ish. And I'm looking at it and thinking, why not? If you're going to buy something British, we're all gonna, always going to need yarn. It's not something that can be overtaken by tech. We need fibres. We need yarns going forward. It's got so many different applications on every single bit of what you know, what is needed around every single facet of our, our, our working life. And and I'm anticipating tomorrow they're going to come out with, with good news. So 
There you go, boys. Do, do I just get my coat? There's a pun there. Anyone missed that oh. one? Okay. Right. Phil, go on. You're smiling. What, what are your thoughts first? Rip it to shreds if you need to. I don't know. I rip it to shreds. I think the only thing that, for me, I think, you know, it is, it is a decent, right. business, decent business, making quite a good profit. Okay. Um, should be sort of a modest, modest grower. I would think, though, if you look at what it sells into, um, you know, things like industrial clothing, things like airbags. I mean, that is that's cyclical. That's cyclical business. Yep. Um, and I think that just going back on Victrex, I, I think one of the things I would disagree slightly on Victrex, so it is, I think it is cyclical. Um, because it's selling into like electronics, automotive, that kind of thing. And you know, often, you know, often the market can be fairly, fairly close to being right when it values shares. Um, when you when you see a company on a cheap multiple, there's often a reason for it. Um, the market will pay high multiples for not just growth, but also very steady, predictable, dependable earnings and cash flows. And I think anything that is arguably prone to, uh, you know, falling off a cliff in a recession won't get that high that high valuation. I think the point about the pension fund you make is 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 very good. You know, you're looking at big cash flow benefit. You know, you're saying two two million a month. So that's twenty four million a year um that's a big positive um and i think that that lot, lots of investors professional investors will stay away from companies with any kind of pension fund issue and when the company comes out and says that it's addressing it or it's addressed it that removes a big negative from from the shares not just in terms of its profitability and its cash flow, but just sentiment towards it. So I, I, I'd agree. There's, you know, it seems to be in a good place right now. Fingers crossed for <laughs> tomorrow's news. I know Henry will be straight into my DMs going uh -uh, <laughs> in the morning. <laughs> so yeah, we'll see. And it's it's been around forever. And we'll, we'd like for one of our British companies to come out and surprise the market. No AI involved. You know, not tech. It's boring yarns and threads and so on and so forth. Um, why not? Let's have something. It's a little bit cyclical. You're spot on there, Phil. Uh, but let's see if it translates into something something good um, tomorrow and they can and surprise the markets, which would be nice. Um, and, and did you want to say anything else about it, Henry, or are you quite happy? Uh, the, the, the only comment I've got, which neither of you have touched on, um, what okay, about go. Far Sorry. East manufacturing undercutting? I mean, if they produce yarns and materials and so on, is that not yeah. ripe for being undercut by foreign imports? Absolutely spot on. If they can get it down the the, the Nile, yeah. If the right, if they can ship it here in time, but that's true. That's what's been <laughs> that's what's been eating the business and every other yarn. I mean, we're both from up north, mate. That's what what do we used to do? You manufacturing know, textiles, was the Revolution Nottingham's about? lace market was yeah. was the lace, place to go. Threads, cotton, you name it, all over the, all over the north, mate, and it's gone down to diddly squat. So this is probably the one of the one of the few remaining um, yarn companies, really, that's actually still doing well. It's market cap of one point one billion, so it's still standing on its own. Liabilities are still sitting up there, quite high. But it's still chug it, chugging along, chugging along. Um, hopefully for many other years to carry on paying those pensions to those people that are still alive and doing well. Anyway, anyway, I don't own it. So it's out there. Another research idea, ladies and gents, that don't want to, um, you know, you can buy it for your British ISA. Put five grand in there for your British ISA. <laughs> anyway. You forgot your Phil, little union last... jack. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> Phil, your last stock of the day, please, sir. And don't pick another one that I own, please. Uh, I don't know, but um, okay. This is a similar sort of idea to uh, the Sniff Smith and Nephew that I spoke about a few minutes ago. Um, it's a business that looks to be coming back after a bit of a difficult time, 
And the company is AG Bar, a soft drinks company. Uh, the ticker is BAG. And this is a company that's best known for uh, Iron Brew, uh, the fizzy drink, which is the be the biggest selling fizzy drink in Scotland. And has it goes been great with a sausage roll. Yeah. Uh, and has been Not with the sausage rolls, mate. Come on, <laughs> carry on, uh, Phil. This is a company that you know a decade ago, or even six, seven years ago, was doing really well. Stock market would put a very high multiple on its on its profits, and it tried to buy. It tried to well merge effectively buy Britvic, um, another UK soft drinks company, and it. It didn't happen, and since then it seems to have been struggling. Arguably, the business has been too reliant on Iron Brew and has lacked exposure to key areas of growth in the soft drinks market. And one of those is energy drinks, and it did have the license to make um, Rockstar Energy. And it lost the license that to, to Britvic. But it's gone along and bought, actually bought its own energy drink now. And it's been trying to create the, an iron brew energy drink, but it's actually bought um, sort of 18 months ago, a company called Boost, Boost Energy. And this is a, this is a nice, a nice uh, addition to the portfolio. And then it's also bought, uh, a tropical drinks business called Rio, which goes with its Rubicon fruit drinks business, and also a uh, porridge products and oats drinks um, business called MoMA. That sounds horrible. <laughs> yeah, although you you might be familiar with the the milk the oat milk business Oatly. Oh yes. Uh, yes. Of, um, we'll we'll see how they get on with this. Um, but I like the acquisition of, of Boost into the energy market. Combine that with lots of things that are going on with um, um, just the production side of it becoming more efficient. And you've got the makings of a decent profit growth story here with recovering margins, um, a much better portfolio of drinks. The one I haven't mentioned as well is they, they have a business called Funkin, F-U-N-K-I-N, which is cocktails business. And that's a really good business. And you've got an outgoing CEO that's been there for 20 years, um, which is often a red flag, that he's being replaced by a guy who's got a lot of exposure, uh, sorry, experience to consumer goods. He's worked for Mars, he's worked for Coca-Cola, did work for super dry, but don't let that put you off. Um, this is a company that's on uh, sub 15 times earnings, good profits, good steady growth. Soft drinks are a very resilient market. They have pricing power. Um, it's not going to, it's not going to double or it's not going to be a multi bagger, but it's a kind of defensive, um, defensive share that you can tuck away in your portfolio and it seems to be moving in the right direction as a much arguably a much higher quality business in terms of its product base product portfolio than it was a few years ago yet the yeah, the valuation stock markets put on it is a lot less than it was a few years ago and i think that makes it interesting I really like this company, Phil. I've, I've liked it for, for a long, long time. And I'm hoping it's not going to turn into another Greggs where I'm just watching it just carry on climbing. But what I've noticed over the last year, year and a bit or so, is how much noise there is around the Rubicon brand, the lychee, the guava, the mango, and all the rest of it. And in America, it's absolutely flying regarding sales and people talking about it. It's like free marketing they're getting over there because people are just raving about it all the while. And I, I think the Rubicon brand, which they've also got an energy drink for as well, by the way, um, could actually be one of the drivers slash catalysts for bag, um, bar, uh, bar AG going forward. Um, I think that that's one of the 
things that most people because the thing is everyone is, is synonymous with iron brew and it, it owns scotland but if they can get any sort of growth in america over the next three years five years that revenue stream for america just under the rubicon brand could be absolutely seismic you know um can they compete against monster and the other energy drinks that are out there um i, I don't know but they're doing okay on the non-energy drink side of it, on the Rubicon side of it. And it's, there's almost all the different flavors, mate. You know, once you've got a student or a person or a family hooked on the Rubicon brand, they're not going to go anywhere else, you know? And it's not fit. Most of the drinks aren't fizzy as well. You know, it's just percentage of lychee, percentage of mango in there. Well, obviously got the the, the energy drinks and the, the fizzy drinks as well. But yeah. I think that's an unrecognised brand that's actually doing okay, Rubicon, within their family of brands. Just to come back on you, if it's going to be Rubicon, they don't they don't have the US market. It's it's going to be. They don't have the. Of course they don't. They're, they're absolutely tiny in there. I'm just saying incremental growth. No, I don't. I don't think they'll be selling it. That's the thing. They they have it to to sell in the UK, not in not in the US. So I don't. Oh. Yeah, yeah. My bad. Yeah, yeah. My bad. Sorry. They haven't got the license to sell in America. No, the point you're making, though, in terms of the popularity of it in the US is is a good one. And you, know, you hope you hope that that can become, become more in trend okay. over here. Um, so, yeah. But, yeah, it's it looks in a lot better shape than it was a few years ago. It's got a much more balanced portfolio of drinks. And energy drinks are, are, are big business. Agreed, agreed. And anything to say about um, AG Bar? A little difficult um, as it's consumer focused. So it's got it's still got this element that I'm wary of. Um, but it is one of these names in the UK that's very old. It's historically done very well. It's been high quality and reliable. And I think Phil's right, to be honest. I think buying it is an untaxing valuation might not be a bad strategy, you know. When I've picked up big blue chip names in the UK market on temporary depressions, they've generally done okay. They don't blow the lights out, but they they tend to recover, you know. And this is a profitable business. It's not doing anything that is outrageous or dangerous or speculative. It's producing drinks that people like and have liked for a long time. Um, and so, yeah, you know, I, I think it's quite a good name, quite an interesting pick. Thank you very much, Phil. Did you want to add anything else to that, or are you finished? The other thing about you know about soft drinks, soft soft drinks generally are doing doing quite well at the moment. Um, you know, Coca Cola, PepsiCo have been very resilient. Um, <clears throat> the Coca Cola Euro Euro Pacific business, um, which has got the the license for the UK and Western Europe, again are doing doing very well, they have pricing power. And you, 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 you're dealing here with relatively inexpensive items that customers can still put in their shopping trolleys or go and buy them from the corner shop. And the companies that can put up prices to uh, offset their, their cost increases and people will still, still buy them. And they don't really have sort of strong own label or private label competition for, for con consumers to trade down to. So I think that's why they've been been pretty resilient. Brilliant. No, thank you for that, Phil. Um, that, that essentially concludes it regarding the stocks I've got to cover today. Um, um, Henry, do you want to quickly tell us what's been happening with the Centrepoint charity? Thank you both for those um, four stocks you've shared and the takeover conversations as well, Phil. Yeah, absolutely. Um, We've had a, we've had another couple of donations in. So for, for those listeners that um, perhaps are joining us for the first time, I'll just briefly say that um, as we put the, the podcast out, um, we ask our audience to donate a few pounds if they can to a charity of our choice. And this year we're raising for Centrepoint, which is the UK's leading homelessness charity. I've got a goal of trying to raise £5,000 by the end of the year. Um, if we can beat that, I will be absolutely over the moon. Um, and we are we're really storming out of the blocks. We're up to 25 percent of the target now. One thousand two hundred and eighty five pounds raised from 32 supporters. 
Um, and since the last show, um, we've had £50 from Bearwood Trader. Great charity choice. Instead of sending Christmas cards to friends uh, and less seen family, I donate the cost of cards and stamps to Centrepoint every year. Love the podcast. Welcome to Phil. Great work, guys. Uh, a fantastic idea in many ways. Very commendable and a pleasure to contribute to a wonderful community. £50 and £12.50 gift aid. No idea who that is, as you put great work, guys, in the uh, in the name box. But thank you very much. We've had another £10 from a child of the 70s. Another great podcast and happy to keep supporting this charity. Really appreciate all the effort that goes into producing the podcasts uh, and thoroughly enjoy the excellent discussions. We've had £20 and £5 gift aid from Nige, 200 SMA. All three of you do a superb job and every day is a school day. A very good cause and I'm happy to help towards your total. Many thanks, Nige from Leicester, a long time ago. Thanks, Nige. And finally, someone called Lester Pete. Excellent podcasts. Well done, guys, and good for you in raising money for charity as you go. Hashtag be kind. Hashtag no paywall. £25 and £6.25 gift aid. So thank you very much, everybody. That's honestly heartwarming. Brilliant. Now, th thanks, thanks everyone for those donations. Um, and if you've got any change um, over the next couple of weeks, please do drop us uh, another donation um, if you haven't done so, or a first donation you haven't done so uh, before. Henry, share us the URL, and um, thanks everyone again. It's uh, for those of you that would like to donate. It is www.justgiving.com forward slash page forward slash twin pete's challenge 24 that's twin pete's challenge 24 thank you for that and lester pete whoever you are if you want to come down for a pint i'll be in the memphis hub on the 25th with the coach the award-winning coach of lester riders because we're doing a fundraising night an event there so please come along for a drink if you want to come along um with rob he's going to be there um the coach of Leicester Riders, the fantastic basketball team. Right, quick heads up here, Phil. This is from a chap called Compound Gains, and he said to me, please do this for me, please. said, hey, Conkers, please could you let Phil Hoakley know that his book was referenced in this podcast from Peter, S Peter Slagger's um, Compounding Quality, Lessons from the Investing Legends. And you were mentioned there, a monk's talking with billions. Billionaires, Phil, your, your book. You know what I mean? So kudos to you, sir. All that work is uh, paid off without in that book. I want to say a big shout out to um, Jam For You, um, at Jam For You underscore 75. He's received all his Harriman House books and his Sherpad prize for winning the competition for 2023. And he's absolutely thrilled with it. Um, and he writes, some nice bedtime reading just arrived with my books courtesy of first prize coming in the Twin Peaks Challenge, um, Sharepad, Sharescope, Harriman House. There should be no excuses now, he's put, regarding getting better at investing. There's a nice picture there of his own of his books. And also a big shout out to Smudge Dan, who came second. Uh, delighted to receive these investing books this morning, courtesy of second place finish in Conquers 3's Twin Peaks Challenge. Um, quite a bit of reading to get through. Thanks to Harriman House for providing the prizes and sending them through. So... Kudos to you too, and very well done. And ladies and gents, that is a wrap. Henry, thank you ever so much. Oh, Phil's got something to say. Yeah, Sorry, Phil. I'd just like to make a small announcement. Um, now, I'm I'm no longer on, on Twitter or X, but I have started a blog, recently just set up a blog, um, keeping it casual and uh, friendly and free. And it's called, it's, you can find it at investingstuff.substack.com. And what you will see on there is very short sort of opinion pieces from me, links to my work, uh, also links to other people's work. And just to say that going forward, things that we discuss on the podcast, like the SharePad data, for example, which we use it's going to be on that 
on that website. So uh, please check it out, uh, investingstuff.substack.com. Brilliant. Good to have you back right in, mate, even more so. Um, thank you ever so much for that. And the three of us also are going to be trying our level best going forward to engage and share some other additional bits and pieces on the SharePad chat on 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 there um, so far. Um, we've not really been engaging with that as much as we should do. And I just want to say a big thank you to all of you, uh, ladies and gents, that kindly um, had a read of my article, um, Eight Common Investing Mistakes That All um, Investors Make. So thank you ever so much for, for giving that a, a little read and giving us your feedback. Um, Henry, do you want to close with anything, sir? Just thank you very much for having me again, chaps. And thank you very much to the audience for tuning in, as always. Don't be strangers. Send us your feedback. Send us a like. Uh, and don't forget to share and subscribe to the channel. Thank you very much. Phil, thank you ever so much again for coming on here and, and raising it up um, uh, 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 the level or two. Um, Henry and I are just sitting there going, oh, oh, that's good. That's good. Brilliant. Thank you again, sir. And we we'll look forward to seeing you. Um, I hope to see some faces on um, Saturday at the Master Investor Show. But until then, we'll see you, the three of us will see you again in two weeks' time, which will be the 20th we'll be recording um, is the next time we're recording. And we'll put this out on Friday for you. I am now crossing everything regarding Coates Group um, coming out with its data tomorrow. Ladies and gents, take care. God bless. Stay kind and look after each other. Until next time, goodbye from all three of us. Bye-bye for now. This Twin Peaks Investing Podcast is brought to you in association with SharePad from ShareScoop, the UK's number one investment data and analysis software for private investors and traders. Visit sharescope.co.uk and discover the advantage.